Hi, Vicki Robin here, host of What Could Possibly Go Right, a podcast sponsored by the Post Carbon Institute, in which we ask cultural scouts the same question, what could possibly go right in the midst of all that's going wrong? Uh, we've published 30 episodes so far, and we're heading into 2021. And I decided to do the crazy thing of interviewing myself uh, as part of the launch of this season. And when I decided to do that, I realized this is not easy. I'm sort of like setting up my guests to really like, what really do I think? Because I ask my guests, like, we don't want to know your analysis of what went wrong. We don't want to know your big prescription of what everybody should do and then the world would work. We want to know, we want to hear your, your seasoned perspective um, based on years of what we call cultural scouting of of like scanning the horizon uh, to find the best course forward, not for yourself per se, but for the tribe, for the community. Um, and so put on your headlamp, you know, look into the murk and tell us what you actually see that we could cooperate with. What is emerging now? Uh, and um, a couple things I love about this and uh, before I interview myself, one is that I'm loving ever more the idea of a cultural scout and that, you know, I just fished it out of the air. The idea is that, is that it's somebody who actually um, has a seasoned, it doesn't matter how many years, but number one, these are people who have an examined, carefully cultivated sense of looking squarely at reality and trying to pick a path, a critical path forward on behalf of the common good. And so it's a kind of attention um, both to what's arising and to the needs of the people or the needs of the planet. So it's, it's and then also I noticed that these are people, you know, when you see, think of a scout, you think of like a mountaintop, you know, or like a hill. And so I think these are really people who've positioned themselves because they've chosen to or because society's done it to them who actually operate more on the margins, whether it's people of color or women, uh, different class, race. It's, it's like people who are a bit, yeah, I think the outsiders are more, are smarter and more aware than the insiders because the insiders are just sitting there like fat, happy cats in the middle of their, their worldview. But the people who are on the outside really need to pay a lot more attention. And anybody who's been marginalized in any way knows this is true. Uh, so basically they've made a concerted effort to see clearly. Um, they have been positioned on the margins of society by choice or by um, prejudice uh, and or class or whatever. Uh, and they have a certain fluidity. There's a sort of a self-reflective consciousness where you, you think you see clearly, you form your own opinion it's not that you're second guessing or doubting yourself. It's like you try on a, a range of perspectives uh, so that you're not just locked into like, how can I move the thing that I think is most important forward? So it's a particular kind of person. And I think that scouting is a, is a learnable skill. So I love that about this. And I love the uh, quality of the question, which is another thing just popped out. Uh, this question, like what could possibly go right and people see it as, as hope, and it is it does have something to do with hope. They see it as positivity and has something to do with positivity. But I see it as, as sort of expectancy without expectation. It's like, if we've made it this far in life, however many millions of years, you know, uh, it, it, there is something installed in us that has that quality of being able to sniff out possibility no matter what, you know, where's the water, where's the food, where's, where's sex, where's, where's danger. Um, and so we have that sense, we have a sense of the future and a sense of possibility. So um, it's not the hairs on the back of your neck, although that's a, probably part of the sensing. Yeah, we've made it this far. So it means that we have a sense of the future. And cultural scouts, I think, have an educated sense of the future. Um, and they look for those openings. Um, and I think you could, it's sort of like someplace between an entrepreneur and a saint, you know, <laughs> it's like that quality of, 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 of precise 
penetrating vision and also the huge heart that wants this to work, not just for oneself, but for everybody. There's always something arising to cooperate with. And, and, and in this past year, I think this has been in some ways the toughest year that many of us have had in decades, really decades. And, um, and it's just, it's like one thing after another, you know? it's, but really it's just been a destabilizing year, which is why I chose to do this podcast and consult with people who I consider cultural scouts, who I turn to, to see more clearly and uh, ask them what they see and eventually decided in partnership with the Post Carbon Institute to keep publishing these because I presume that all of you are also making a good faith effort to create a picture in your mind of, of what's going on and what the, what the clear choices are, you know? And it's, I think it's even harder when you're working against um, things that look like catastrophes you know, when everything is going well, it's so easy to be cheerful and creative. But, you know, when you're when you've got a definite headwind, which the pandemic and the racial justice uprising and the, you know, the insane election process in the United States. And, and I mean, we've just been in a, a traumatizing time. The things that were predictable are not predictable. Um, I'm recording this right now as as Texas is experiencing the result of having uh, having a don't tread on me um, energy system, you know, where they were, they weren't hooked into the grid, they couldn't borrow a cup of uh, energy from elsewhere. And so I mean, but that's just one of the instabilities I could be recording at a time when there was a fire someplace or a hurricane or, um, you know, some, some aging infrastructure suddenly collapses. I mean, this is the time we're in, we're just, we're, we're groaning at the edges. And of course, climate the climate disruption now that the we've in the United States the election uh, whole process has been completed. We have a new president, and um, who's making um, what I consider sane decisions, um, and is recognizing that we're up against it in terms of climate change, and so instability is our us. Uh, so anyway. Um, it's a way of being with what is arising. So what could possibly go right? Asking cultural scouts. So now, Vicki, we're going to ask you. <laughs> okay, Vicki, in the midst of all that is going wrong, um, what could possibly go right? Yeah, I want to start talking a little bit about what I learned from my guests, uh, my 30 guests so far, some of the things that were really jumped out at me uh, that have been informing my perspective. It's sort of like part of how I'm educating my, my capacity as a cultural scout is like synthesizing what I've heard from my guests. And one of the things I would say is that a lot of them, it all comes down. I mean, there's something in there where justice is the sort of the keystone or the linchpin. It's really interesting, the word justice, because uh, it, has, it has a meaning in it of aligning, of a proper alignment of elements. You know, you, you justify the edge of a page. Um, you justify the margins. Uh, so there is something about uh, not too much, not too little, just right. Is there's a Goldilocks quality to justice that um, a place for everything and everything in its place is what my mother used to tell me. If you could see behind the screen, you know I didn't learn it. Um, but it's it's a quality of just rightness. It's and that it, it, we are so far out of balance with a system that privileges um, money finance, accounting, oil, you know, we live, we live in a system that is extremely hard to do anything if it violates the, uh, the tenets of the basic religion, which is money and capitalism and the fact that money makes money, the financialization of the living world. Uh, so 
because that sits in the middle. Injustice is everywhere. You know, the, the other elements that belong in a living world, <laughs> the world that we were born into, and um, the other elements that belong here do not have any space to breathe, really, they can't breathe. So it's, it's, it's racial justice for sure. And that's been, that's come to the top of the list in this last year as well it should. And there's, um, I think there's a lot of truth telling going on. We're doing the truth part. Maybe eventually we'll do the reconciliation, but uh, it's just beautiful how much truth is coming out uh, and how much, you know, if you can tolerate it, how much we're, uh, what privileged white people are discovering how blind we've been. So the racial justice piece, and there's also the economic justice piece. And it's, you know, if, if there's anything that is sort of more telling, it's that the uh, Trump's tax breaks advantaged um, the those with wealth and um, looked like it was like a little, you know, a few, few breadcrumbs to the, to the middle class, but those breadcrumbs are being scooped up now. Um, so the level of economic injustice is it's it's so extreme that I think that people are now like like staying home and staying put and staying in your lane is getting to be less safe than protest. You know, I, I just you can start to see it. You know, people are wondering why are the people in the United States not out in the streets, uh, and we're starting to be. And of course we had the, the storming of the Capitol. And that was one subset of people storming the halls of power because they, they have a felt sense that something is not right. But there's plenty that's not right. And I don't particularly consider that their analysis of what was wrong, what's wrong, what's rotten in the state of Denmark is correct or that their actions are correct. But it's like the pressure is getting us out there because the injustice, the economic injustice, the injustice of like, access to resources and opportunity is just, it's like pulled our society apart. And then there's intergenerational justice. Uh, and I had one of my guests was Jane Davidson, who um, is a, an elected official in Wales. And she introduced the first bill, you know, introduced, but got passed the first uh, recognition of intergenerational justice, putting it in law, you know, and that's what sustainable development is. It's like meeting the needs of the current generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. That's justice. And basically <laughs> it's like, you know, back, back when I used to live on the road, you know, you'd see these campers, you know, that had the bumper sticker, I'm spending my children's inheritance. And it's sort of basically that's what we're doing. Um, and so and we, we know it's wrong, but nobody's stopping us. So it's starting to look at intergenerational justice and, um, and then interspecies justice. Like why is it that humans should consider the rest of the planet ours to exploit? I mean, number one, it's gonna crash the whole system. The, the, uh, but also it's just, it's just unjust, you know? And it's like, we're slowly getting to the point where we realize that no, we're not special, we're not exceptional. We're, we're one of many and, and, and we miss our kin terribly, and we've, you know, and even the bugs, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like, that's not okay that the whole web of life is being de deconstructed. So it just feels to me that, that the central theme that I derived from talking to my guests and also that I am embodying is this idea of justice. It's even ecological justice. It's like, you know, places are having the rights of rivers have their riverbed. You know, everything in life has developed its place in relationship with everything else in life. And, and by occupying your right place, you're in right relationship. You know, the, the trees and the, the riparian zone and the fish, you know, get to like um, feed and like the shallows and the, and the shade, you know, there's all the things fit together. And so there's a, there's a quality of not like, humans just keep your mitts off everything, but there's a quality of ecological justice. So I, I found that very inspiring and really actionable. You know, it's a way that I can, it's a frame I can use to look through things. And then that's the other thing is that it was just so clear 
that people were, were, I could hear not only what they were saying, but the frameworks th through which they were viewing the world, you know, and um, as I said, I think cultural scouts are sort of framework literate, you know, they, they're framework fluid, they, they can put on many frames, they can put on a secular frame and a religious frame. You know, they, they're not stuck in one framework. I think a lot of times people who are very positional and reactionary are stuck in one frame and their frame has to be right or else their whole world collapses because they don't have anything else. So I really heard, you know, like, like frameworks of trauma, you know, and, and personal trauma and intergenerational trauma. And looking through that frame, you see the world in a particular way or values, you know, what you say is important. That's a framework or, or history, you know, like Heather Cox Richardson is so interesting because I've been listening to her all year and she is educating me on the frame of American history, what American history has really been about, you know, according to Heather. Uh, and I didn't have that frame. I just had sort of eighth grade history. I didn't have, I didn't have an educated frame um, and then, and then it helped me see that I have frames, you know, and I'm, I'm really challenging myself, you know, part of this year has been, you know, pick your favorite media and call every other outlet fake news, but I'm pretty wedded to <laughs> my mainstream media, my liberal media, you know, with, you know, uh, sprinkled with Amy Goodman and truth out, you know, I have, I, I have my lefty. Uh, things and I have some things I check the Wall Street Journal. So I have I have this sort of news preferential frame, and and I'm not saying that it, that any you know Breitbart is just as good as the New York Times. It is not. <laughs> I think one of the things about listening to the cultural scouts is that I have increased my literacy. I have increased the lenses that I can look through. Uh, it's like I'm, I, my seeing is more refined because I can see through all these different frameworks. You know, what do I see emerging? I, I really, one of the things I would say is that as, as unpleasant as it is, uh, the breakdowns are so necessary. We cling to our frameworks. We cling to, you know, who I am and where I live and who my family is and who my friends are and who my enemies are and, you know, what I eat, <laughs> we cling to our habitual way of life until it is untenable. And, and life generally, the, you know, the financialization of life is untenable. It is leading us to ruin. Um, and, and it has to become untenable. And it, it, this is not punishment. This is not, I don't, my frame is not, this is Gaia kicking us in the butt. This is just, we are at the end of a story and the, the, you know, the emperor has no clothes now and re, we are seeing it. And the emperor is gonna fight for power, uh, um, but we're gonna, the more truth we can see as painful as it is, the more we're going to be able to be cultural scouts is in to recognize what is arising that we can cooperate with. I'm not like ghoulish, like, yay, it's falling apart. <laughs> but I am very grateful for this. And I'm very grateful that that I think, you know, people have gotten very political, at least in the United States. I feel like we, we were on sort of cruise control on politics, uh, opinionated, but not really in the game. And I think this last year we've seen we have to be in the game. And it's not necessarily a battle of good and evil or left and right. It is... It is reclaiming our agency as citizens and that we have a say in how we run our collective lives. And we're either gonna get there through beating each other up or we'll get there through the tough process of politics. And politics is like a trailing edge. It's like 20 years after something should happen. It does happen through politics, but nonetheless, we cannot sit on the sidelines anymore. And I, so I'm just very heartened by that. Um, and I think I'm getting more sophisticated. I think I'm, I'm able to pay attention to politics without wanting to scream. Um, <laughs> I'm working hard on it. You can ask any of my friends. Um, so I think that is something that is going right. And I think we're, 
you know, I, I, I have all sorts of dystopian ideas and personal pain around the shutting down of socializing in our society. A society is social. You know, we're social, we're social animals. We, I learn through being with other people. And so God bless, we have Zoom and, and all this stuff. But um, I long for a return to the streets uh, and being um, bumping into one another. There's, a, there's been a benefit and I'm not sure how it's going to um, play out because the benefit is that, that you probably are having the same experience that you show up on a Zoom call and there's a hundred people and they're from all over the world. We're suddenly talk about framework literacy. We're suddenly being able to, uh, to see through so many different eyes not just the eyes of the people who are right around us. I think that is having a positive effect. And it's also um, more and more of us are realizing that we're content creators. You know, <laughs> I, think, I think you probably, there's probably some graph about when I started doing this, um, these interviews last March, um, we've probably doubled the number of podcasters um, since then. Because everybody's realizing I'm a creator. I can just like sit here and publish. And, you know, a lot of it, <laughs> I, I sometimes check out TikTok and Instagram and stuff like that. A lot of it is in name, but some of it is very, very creative. There's something that's getting mixed up in us and, and maybe part of the benefit of this crashing of our ability to be a society together is that we're learning how to do it electronically and hopefully we will not that will not be our preferred mode and then we'll just be scared of other people and I, I, one other thing I want to say um, is that you know frameworks that are set in motion are stories you have characters the characters have goals the goals are in conflict they have needs um, they have strategies for meeting their needs. And once you have all of that moving, then you have a drama, you have a story unfolding. And about a year ago, this story occurred to me, this framework actually. Um, and there's a shaggy dog story associated with it. But, but this, the essence of it is that there, there's four stories competing for dominance now in our world. And, and the stories are about what matters, what's good, true, and beautiful, what's the goal of life, what, is the, what are, the, what are the, the highest aspirations one can um, work toward. And my sense is that these stories are, in, are an anathema to one another and they're all vying for dominance. Being able to see it that way, I think for me has been helpful. Um, and it really came out of a joke. <laughs> of like you know somebody told, said this joke about after the rapture can I have your car um you know the rapture is when when the saved souls are going to be swept up to heaven and the rest of us uh, sinners will be left behind um but the goal so the the goal of the that religious story is that the world is a mortal coil it is a veil of tears it is a, a cesspool of sin and we work our way through it and, and, and we try to save ourselves through our religion and so that we can go to heaven and heaven is where all the good stuff is. So then that makes like, you know, daily life is just the struggles of daily life are simply sort of like an obstacle course to prove that you're good and so you can get to heaven. And I'm not trying to be dismissive of anybody's religion. It's just framing it now. And then there's another one that says that that the aspiration is is the singularity. It's really that the point is not carbon-based life. The point is intelligence. And so as intelligence is is replicated and actually improved in silicon-based life, silicon, then you, you know, you don't have to have agriculture, you don't have to have bathrooms, you know, it's, it's a lot of things that fall away that we we may have a sort of a, a sentimental feeling about. Um, carbon-based life and in other words human bodies and you know just the living world but it's not necessary for what really is the point which is the penetration of reality by the human intellect 
So that's one story, and that's really not not that's sort of in conflict with this other story. And then there's the third story is that the future is in the stars, not in heaven, um, not in the singularity, but in the stars. You know that basically it's the story of enterprise. You know, like the the avatar would be Elon Musk, if you will. You know that that basically the adventure is the human progress. Human progress is the adventure. And so, and then the fourth story is the story I live, really, which is, this is heaven. We're, we're, Gaia is heaven. We, we live in the garden. Um, and the only thing that expels us from the garden is the unwillingness to um, experience ourselves as part of it. Uh, so we have these four stories. And if you think about it, you know, like the Elon Musk story or the AI story or the rapture stories are all stories that treat what I consider the living world as a dead or degraded object to be rejected or transcended. And so a lot of the upset and the activism I do is to protect the living world. I mean, the story of progress, that's an anathema. We're in the way of that, you know, it's like Keystone Pipeline, you know, all the pipelines, that only, that makes sense in the story of progress. It makes no sense in the story of Gaia. So all these stories are in conflict. And I think it's just, to me, I think that what's happening now in part is that these stories are becoming evident and the conflict between them is becoming evident. And you know, sustainable development, way back in the 1980s, the term was coined to talk about that intersection of the sort of crash course between economic uh, growth and ecological integrity. And, and, and human, um, human well-being. So all the way back in the 80s, we recognized that we're on this collision course. And these stories to me help me see that some way, if you want to talk about we have to learn to live together, how do these stories reconcile? How do the characters in this story get their needs met in the presence of the other characters? And there's no vanquishing anybody and having it be whole. So that, <laughs> yeah, so what could possibly go right is I think it's, you know, if you want to use a religious term, it's a time of revelation and uh, it's a time of the apocalypse and the apocalypse really is, you know, not to be like uber um, um, religious about it, but the apocalypse is the unveiling. It is the unveiling of the the darkness inside the systems that support our lives, uh, whether we consciously or unconsciously cooperate with them. So what could possibly go right is that we become more conscious. And uh, what could possibly go right is that what could possibly go right uh, flourishes uh, so that we can keep providing you with these different facets of perspectives, these different um, perspectives on reality so that you can stand in the middle of all of this wisdom and make better choices for yourself to see more clearly uh, to act more courageously in service to the common good thank you hey thanks for listening don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five star review which will help this hopeful message get out to more people and check out the post carbon institute website for show notes and for more guest information. Thanks to all our donors for their support. Thanks also to Cher Miller, Amy Boringrud, and Clara Winter at Post Carbon Institute, plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com.